is Marcus Armrosner, and my job today is to keep you awake after lunch. <laughs> and what a more beautiful topic that could be the, the lovely kernel command line. This presentation has three parts. First, we'll explore some requirements. Then I'll show how our current command line fails to meet them. And finally, I'll propose what to do about it. Part one. Running KMU can be as simple as this. There's a couple of options with and without arguments. And there's one complex option, which is the comma separated list of key cross value. Simple enough, nothing unusual. But of course, we frequently run KMU like this. <laughs> <laughs> and here we clearly push the command line beyond its intended use. Use cases like this one are better served by config files. And that leads me to my first requirement. Whatever, whatever I can do on the command line, I want to be able to do in a configuration file. There is another configuration uh, interface, and that's the monitor. In this talk, I completely ignore the human monitor and use QMP and monitor interchangeably. To interact with the monitor, you send it a command, you get back a response. Both commands and responses are JSON objects. Why do we have two configuration interfaces? Well, at the runtime, we have to use the monitor because the com line, command line is gone then. For initial configuration, we want to use the command line because, well, we've always done it that way and we turn like a tanker. And besides, we do anything for backward compatibility. Some things we want to configure both in the command line and in QMP. For instance, we want to create character device backends during initial startup with dash cardf and at runtime with the QMP's cardf add. Our infrastructure should support that. And that means, first, the command line in QMP should be equally expressive. So QMP needs to be able to express the command line's key equals value thing, and the command line needs to express QMP's JSON object. Second, we want the two external interfaces to drive a single internal interface, and they should be able to do so with equal ease. The command line evolves constantly. This, is, this graph shows the number of lines in output of their help over time, and as you can see, <coughs> It has grown by roughly 5% per year, year over year. It used to grow even faster. Programs interfacing with QMU need to cope with this change. Unless they are willing to tie themselves to a specific version of QMU, they need to figure out what the QMU they got can do. This involves questions like what options are available. Say, does this QMU support dash block death? What keys does a certain option support? Does dash spice support Unix? And what values a certain key supports? Does dash block dash support driver equals cluster? In the same way, to do that is to have QMO expose an interface to, do, to introspect, introspect the command line, just like it supports introspecting QMP. Are these needs met? Well, not really. And to understand that, we need to explore how things are done. Here's a piece of code to define a command line option. It's simple enough. It's the option is called dash msg. It has a mandatory argument. This is the text for dash help. As you can see, it documents the argument can either be timestamp stamp equals on or off. And this is the text for the user manual. Note that the option arguments format is documented in help and manual text, but it's not specified in code. That code lives elsewhere. Now let's explore how command line option, uh, parsing works. Let's start with a really simple option like dash help, no arguments, or dash HDA, simple file name argument. Well, we do it the obvious way. We get the next option and option argument, if any. 
and then we either execute it right away, say print help and exit, or we record the option for later in global state. And then we move on to the next option. This is how many simple programs work, and it is how Creamo worked until version 0 0.6. But of course, we have more complex options, options with complex arguments, arguments that need to be parsed. That's not hard, we splice in a parser right here. And we've done that pretty enthusiastically, so by now we have more than 20 of them, all different. Eventually, somebody noticed, realized that adding more and more ad hoc parsers is silly. So he set out to create the QMO options argument parser to end all QMO options argument parsers. And that is QMO ops. It parses a generic key equals value syntax, and it always records for later. Of course, we haven't been able to resist the temptation to additionally do a little action on the side. Not in QMOps proper, because that's unable to do that, but in the code using it. And that is how command line parsing works since 0 0.12 until today. The old stuff is still around. All the options that go through the orange cloud completely bypass QMOps. The options that go through the purple cloud, they're kind of impure because the extra options, that's not how QM ops wants to be used. And we see why this is a problem in a minute. Only the options on the green straight and narrow path use QM ops as it is intended to be used. This state of affairs impacts our configuration files. Because our configuration files apply to QM ops state, the state QM ops records. There's write config, writes it out. There's read config, reads it in, and that's it. For the options that take the green straight and narrow path, that works just fine. But for the purple cloud, that's broken because we read in the state and that's it. The extra actions are skipped. And for the orange options, they, they just don't work. There's write config, doesn't write out anything, and there's read config, can't read in anything. And that means that sadly, only about one in five command line options actually work in config files. Introspection is similarly affected because it's also based on QM ops. QMP's query command line options has no other source of truth. The green options, again, work just fine. The purple options work fine here too because query command line options isn't bothered by the extra actions. And the orange options are simply not covered in introspection. So introspection, again, covers roughly one out of five options. This is kind of sad. So if the orange cloud and the purple cloud create so many problems, the fix seems obvious. Get rid of them. Have QM ops take over. And this has been, in fact, the plan A since forever. If something has been plan A since forever, there must be problems. One of them is obvious. We want to stay compatible to more than 20 ad hoc parsers. But there's more. QMOPS itself has issues. And I'll show you. First, let's look into QMOPS data model. It is derived from the abstract key equals value syntax. So this is a list of keyword parameters all optional, with string values. The whole list is encapsulated in C-type QM ops. And that means that in C, option parameters are all dynamically typed. For convenience, we throw in a feature to restrict values to integer or bool. This is about the stupidest model that could possibly work, and I have a lot of respect for that. You should always try that first. Time for an example. This is our friend dash msg again. Recall dash msg has a single parameter and can be timestamp e time equals on or off. How do we do that in QM ops? No, simple enough, we declare a parameter named timestamp with the Boolean type. QM ops works just fine here. Note that this option argument definition is separate from the option definition we saw earlier. 
They are in two different files and connected only by C code. Next example, dash numa. Dash numa has a mandatory parameter type and additional parameters depending on the value of type. So with type equals no node, there is an additional parameter, node ID. But QMOPS can't express that. So the best we can do is we declare no parameters. That leaves checking keys and values entirely to the code using QMOPS. It also means no introspection because QMOPS uh, query command line options will happily return there are no parameters. So if we didn't declare any, they are not. How does the code look like? Well, first, here's the code to pass dash numa's option argument. First, we find the declaration we just saw. Then we use it to pass the option argument. And then we laboriously get and check all the parameters. Lots and lots of tedious string manipulation. Third example, dash block dev. Dash block dev is a command line's equivalent to QMP's block dev add. Block dev add's argument is a tree. But QMOPS is by design flat. So what do we do? We flatten the arguments tree with dotted keys. Dotted keys look like this on the command line, and they work like this. The basic idea is we specify the tree by listing its string valued leaves. And a dotted key encodes a path to a leaf. So file.driver equals file means the root of the tree is an object which has a member file, which is an object which has, <coughs> has a member driver whose value is a string file. This is clever, <coughs> but there are issues. First, it is bolted on the QMOP, so again, bye bye introspection, hello extra code. Next, it's inconsistent with other workarounds we have elsewhere, and which we can't get rid of because we can get its backward compatibility. And it can express most, but not all, trees. Consider the empty list. There are no string valued leaves there. There's more, but we are running out of time. So our command line fails to meet a number of needs. Our configuration files are incomplete and inadequate. The command line's expressive power is significantly weaker than QMP's. Driving a single C interface requires tedious glue code. We saw string manipulation and dotted keys and there's more. And command line introspection is anemic compared to QMP's. What shall we do about it? Well, in fact, we've done something about it already. When I showed you the code to pass dash numa ally, this is the actual code. Numa options is a quappy type to represent dash numa's option argument. What is a quappy type? I'll explain in a minute. We take the QM ops and we map it to a numa option. This mapping checks, so all the string manipulation moves from option-specific code into this generic mapping code. And we then can use parameters just by dotting into the struct, and there they have the appropriate C type, so fewer string manipulation and also static typing. Okay, but, but what's a QAPI type? QAPI is the infrastructure behind QMP. QAPI types are defined in the QAPI schema. This is NUMA options, or part of it. And QAPI compiles these, NUMA <coughs> these QAPI types to C types, plus code to serialize to and from JSON, introspection, and more. This is a C type it generates for NUMA options. It's pretty pedestrian. You might probably have written stuff like that yourself many times. QAPI has a number of advantages over QMOPS. First of all, it has a much more expressive type system. There are, <coughs> there are enumerations 
algebraic types, sum and product types, which can be arbitrarily nested. This permits more precise introspection. The generated C types are much nicer to use than QM ops and strings. This is pretty obvious when you compare interfaces made for QMP to interfaces made for the command line. The former use nice C types, the latter use QM ops and strings and generate suck. When both of them have to drive a single interface, <coughs> there has to be conversion and that sucks too. So this mapping of QM ops to copy looks like progress, so maybe QM ops map to copy should take over. No, not so fast. Options are then defined in three places, which is starting to get ridiculous. More seriously, the mapping code is built around the design assumption that everything is flat, and that conflicts with dotted keys. And moreover, it only adds to our compatibility headaches. And this is all fixable, but I feel strongly that it's way too much stuff bolted on the QM ops, workarounds, hacks. QM ops was a fine design back then. But our needs have since grown, and we've outgrown QM ops. And I feel it's time to scrap it and start over. So that's my plan. Quapi takes over. Let's see what I've got cooking. This is how I propose to define a command line option in the future, in, the, in one place in the Quapi schema. If you're familiar with the Quapi schema, this will look like exactly like a command line, uh, like a QMP command definition to you, which sort of makes sense because an option is similar to a command, except it can't return anything and it runs only at a specific point in time. There's an additional feature that's for the help text. Quapi then takes all these option definitions and compiles them into a single function, Quapi options parse. The function takes an argument vector and returns an array of parsed options. A parsed option is a tagged union. The tag identifies the option and the union member represents the options argument. The code to pass dash numa changes as follows. The conversion from QM ops to <coughs> numa option goes out. Instead, we fish the numa options out of the array returned by copy pass options, copy options pass. That's a nice simplification. I mentioned that dotted keys can't express all the JSON objects. So I made copy options pass support JSON in addition to dotted keys. Dotted keys are nicer for simple cases, and they are needed, of course, for backwards compatibility. But JSON is more general and recommended for programmatic use. So can this design meet our command line needs? Let's check them. Configuration files. Yes, we can read JSON from a configuration file just as easily as we can read it from a QMP socket. Expressive power, well, it's the same as QMP with JSON arguments, and it's pretty close with dotted keys. Driving a single in C interface, yes, because now the two are really command line and QMP are similar. They both use the same copy schema, the same copy types. The common interface can also use these types, so there's no really no need for conversion. Introspection, yes, we can introspect the command line just like we introspect QMP, same mechanisms. Backwards compatibility. Hmm. <laughs> Quapi taking over avoids or addresses a whole number of issues we have, but it can't avoid all our backwards compatibility issues. We want to stay compatible to more than 20 ad hoc parsers. In the short term, we can make the option argument a string in the copy schema and pass that string to the existing parser. That, of course, defeats introspection, but we are no worse off than before. In the longer term, we want a proper copy schema, and we'll then need a way to say in the copy schema, okay, use this real parser over there instead of the normal one. We want to stay compatible to the existing bolted-on dotted keys. I think we are good there. 
we want to stay compatible to the existing bolted on conversion to Quapi. And that means we get to replicate its extra features and corner cases, such as automatic flattening, special syntax for integer lists, and so forth. And of course, we want to stay compatible to all the QM ops and eccentricities we've acquired over the years. And so we get to replicate those two. Various syntactic sugar, trickery around repeated keys, special semantics for keys, key ID, and it goes on and on and on. At this point, I think it's fair to ask, must it be? Do we have to do all this work for backward compatibility? Well, backward compatibility is a choice. We choose how much pain to inflict on ourselves to avoid inconveniencing our users. Up to what point are the opportunity costs worth it? That's a question that we as a community need to decide. Where do we stand with this work? I posted an RFC patch, and here are the highlights and some of its lowlights. All options are Quapified. So they are all defined in the Quapi schema, and the old means to define command line options are gone. Most option arguments are not fully Quapified yet. And Quapifying them will be a lot of work, including a lot of backward compatibility work. Introspection works. It's currently meshed together with QMP introspection because that was easiest. We may want to separate the two, or maybe not, we'll see. Configuration files are not yet implemented, but they should be on. And finally, at this stage, the, genera the generated documentation looks even more terrible than usual. And with that, I would like to say thank you, and are there any questions? Yep. Over there. Rich. Hi, Marcus. You, you had an example with dash block dev and block dev add. Will those actually have identical Quapi schemas now? Yes. They use the same Quapi type as the argument. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, what about the configuration files, read config and write config? Can you talk a bit about that, a uh, plan for that? Um, I know you've discussed a bit on IRC and so probably. So no. right now our configuration files use Windows ini syntax, which is fine for flat, less fine for trees. And we want trees. So the obvious choice is to just read, read JSON and maybe maintain some backward <laughs> compatibility for the old files. You might want to consider TOML for the um, configuration files, which is basically an identical data model to JSON, but at the flat level looks like an any file. Cool. Um, it's used a bunch in Rust's cargo stuff. So Can you send me a pointer? Sure. Thanks. Uh, and I think um, this this sounds to me like something that needs some testing. Maybe it, uh, it's um, worth putting a us, yes. yeah, putting a Google, <laughs> maybe a Google Summer of Code project could be to to write some kind of so used introspection to do something. If you permit me one minute to go on a little rant of mine, uh, we care so much for backward compatibility that whenever somebody spots something in patch review, we bend over backwards to fix it but we don't quite care enough for it to actually test backward compatibility. So my patch series comes with tests for the new infrastructure, but that's infrastructure, that's not sufficient. We also need to test the end-to-end, -end, the options that they still work. So how much effort do you think we will have to just find out how much compatibility we will break? Are we going to know what exactly it will break or it will be difficult to even find all the cases where compatibility will break? We can make an educated guess now and we'll be wrong in some details. So this is a good question, but it's really, really hard to answer. Yeah, that, that would lead to my other question is to it looks like it would be 
a lot of work to make some kind of, not even inside Camel, maybe some wrapper that could translate keep compatibility by just translating to the new options somehow. But if you can't even find what are the options that are going so to break. There's a number of ways to do this. You could try to figure out <coughs> how to do it incrementally. That's easy when you can have the old and the new sit side by side, but how can you have two mains like sit by side, side by side? It's difficult. And then there's a lot, a lot of magic in the old command line, which I haven't even touched. Like order of things. It isn't left to right, it's magic. And wh when it breaks, we, we juggle it until <coughs> it works again. It's more magic. Usually it breaks something else then. Okay. Um, m m one more question. Uh, did you do it dash CPU on your series or just put a pointer on your on the custom parser? I haven't touched that yet. Yet. It's, okay. it's hairy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, you said in the uh, patch series you posted, you hadn't actually um, converted all the option values. You just left them as a plain string. Yes. How does that uh, work if you want to use if you if you want to use the, the the JSON syntax for specifying the argument? You must have to have a schema defined for that. Well, um, for those options, the JSON syntax doesn't work. Okay, so it's not so un until until you actually convert all of the opt args, you can't really use the JSON syntax. You can use it only option by option. Yeah. Like <coughs> even before this series, you could use it for dash block dev. And with this series, you can use it a bit more. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking it's not, the, it's not the case that your patches merge and then we lip that could change over to using the JSON syntax whilst you do all the nasty nope. hacks for all the little bits. No, nope. this is a two weeks effort, this patch series, RFC. Yeah, okay. Uh, we do have a lot of deprecated uh, stuff in command line. Do you, are you going to take them away with this occasion? Well, I hope to get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, just uh, have someone write a, uh, to take out the stuff and write a separate program that parses? the old ones and produces something that's compatible with the new stuff and then remove everything. That would be wonderful, but it's also a lot of work. It's just it, different. it is a lot of work anyway, yeah. I think. This. So, no more time, sorry. If you have more questions, come to me. Thank you. <laughs>